It's quiet here. Now outside these buildings, all you can hear is the sound of the breeze and calls of birds. But when I was a young man, a research psychologist visiting this place, standing outside these buildings, all you could hear was human screams. This was Penhurst. Those screams, heard by Dr. Conroy years ago, like these shuttered and boarded buildings, are now silent. The residents of these halls are all gone. But held within this brick and mortar is their story, a story that echoes to the core of our nation and resonates with the spirit of our people, especially Americans with disabilities. Contained within 20 empty buildings, resides the narrative of some of those very Americans. Theirs is an account of tremendous suffering and darkness, met by incredible courage and fortitude of spirit. This is the story of a silenced and abandoned people finding a collective voice, claiming their freedom and changing our world and our hearts forever. In 1908, the institution was established under the name the Eastern Pennsylvania Institution of the Feeble-Minded and Epileptic. As defined by its founding legislation, its express purpose was to be a home for the, quote, detention, care, and training of idiotic and feeble-minded persons. Time would bear out a strong emphasis on this leading directive of detention. In that time, medical treatment for the intellectually disabled consisted of forceful segregation and sterilization of youth deemed as, quote, feeble-minded. The belief was that this wholesale practice was best for the sake of the disabled and for society at large. It was social Darwinism in literal, brutal practice. Over the first half of the 20th century, the complex swelled from a few hilltop halls overlooking the Schuylkill River into a 1,200-acre complex of over 25 buildings. In 1924, the name was changed to Penhurst State School and Hospital, a name that would eventually earn infamy. In time, the complex housed upwards of 3,500 patients. Through most of Penhurst history, the admission of individuals to the institution required only a court order or a doctor's certification of an individual's mental retardation and need of care. Such certification would irreversibly change an individual's life. The complex, similar to many others throughout the nation, was constructed to be a separate world, a microcosm built to handle the problem of intellectually disabled people. Over its 80 years of operation, more than 10,500 souls were dispatched to Penhurst. Many were children at the time of their admission. They would grow from childhood to old age, with no choice of leaving the institution, no opportunity or freedom to return to larger society. Theirs was an America decidedly without liberties. Despite the feeling of stability and order inspired by the brick facades and the slate roofs of the Jacobian Revival buildings, the reality of life inside Pinhurst was steeply betrayed by these stately structures. In hospital-like dormitories, the interned residents lived year upon year, sleeping in beds stacked end-to-end -end in great halls. The extremely disabled were confined to metal cage-like cribs. By the 1950s, conditions at Penhurst had deteriorated to a dangerous level. Chronic understaffing meant that residents, especially those with the greatest needs, were largely unsupervised. Custodial warehousing was the norm for those with the most severe disabilities, with little or no attempt made to provide any meaningful therapy. 
The perceived professional wisdom of the time was that individuals with severe and profound intellectual disabilities were hopeless. It was the prevailing belief they could not progress. Any attempt at treatment was viewed as meaningless. For a population of 3,500 residents, the institution had a staff of only 600. Most residents suffered injuries or abuse at the hands of others or themselves. Despite the heroic work of some underpaid and grossly overworked staff, the tide of unmet human need at Pennhurst vastly overwhelmed the institution's resources. The horror of life at Pennhurst remained neatly hidden from public view. The sprawling forested grounds deliberately kept these forgotten people and their plight concealed from public knowledge. A movement of change was building, however, growing with the larger civil rights movement of the 1960s. Residents and resident advocates were starting to organize. In 1968, Bill Baldini was a journalist working with a local NBC affiliate. Baldini had become aware of the conditions at Pennhurst and the station allowed him to pursue the story. We entitle our investigative report, Suffer the Little Children. In their living rooms, the citizens of southeastern Pennsylvania watched the reality of the horrors and injustices just beyond their own backyards. The 2,800 children, young and old alike, residing within the confines of Pennhurst are for the most part protected from society and the granite wall of ignorance and social blindness protects society from them. The public was shocked and sickened by what they saw. The winds of change began to finally shift with the turning of a new decade. Through the 1970s, the civil rights movement of the intellectually disabled began to crystallize in the form of a series of unprecedented lawsuits. Through these cases, access to public education was open to the intellectually disabled. Ultimately, their rights were recognized to be constitutionally protected under the 14th Amendment. Most significant, though, was a case involving a young woman named Terry Lee Halderman. Admitted to Pennhurst at age 12, in the 11 years Terry lived at Pennhurst, her development regressed. She lost her limited ability to speak and suffered over 40 reported injuries, many the direct result of physical abuse. In Halderman versus Pennhurst, the class action lawsuit representing Terry's plight and that of many others at the institution, Judge Raymond Broderick ruled that forced institutionalization of disabled people was unconstitutional. The landmark ruling ultimately closed Pennhurst and numerous other institutions like it. No more could the disabled be denied their rights as American citizens. No longer would those with special needs be hidden away in secluded institutions. Basic human rights and protected civil liberties were legally theirs at last. 